everybody. Hey, Dave, how are you? Great. How are you? Good. Well, welcome, everybody. My name is Avery Saltzman. And I'm David Eisner. And we're the co-artistic directors of the Harold Green Jewish Theater Company. Wanted to welcome you to our fifth uh, installment of our virtual talk show, uh, Conversations on the Green. It is Wednesday, July, July 22nd. Yeah. It's 1 p.m. and we are... Live. Yes, we live. are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's hard to believe it's five it's five shows already it's, uh, and summer's flying by very fast yeah very, very fast. fast well ladies and gentlemen uh, while you're watching the show there's going to be two um banners underneath uh that you know during this COVID time you know we are bringing you this wonderful programming and we have a lot coming out in the fall uh again so um we're always interested we're always thankful when you have uh, take the time to uh donate if you can um Anytime during the program, you can just, uh, there we go, to make a donation, you just click the link below. And also, there'll be another banner going underneath, because next Wednesday, on the 29th of July, is another live event. Dave, you want to talk a little bit about that, just for well, a second? We're, we're, we're so excited. Uh, and Mark is going to be playing. And you're going to be in it as well. And I am. I'm the surprise guest. Surprise. You're the surprise. Don't tell anybody, please. Exactly. And Gabby Epstein um, is going to do this remarkable concert on live. Uh, she's going to tell stories, sing some amazing songs. And you can sign up. It's $36 per household. And it's really going to be a remarkable uh, evening of, of music. Um, we have uh, a stream stage who's producing this with us. And uh, I know you'll love it. So all you have to do yeah. is when you see the, and there it is below, is sign up now because you can see it live, but you'll also have the link, I think, for about 72 hours. Um, and uh, you can, for 36 bucks, you get the best seat in the house. Absolutely, for your whole family. Right, go ahead. Absolutely. And, and I also wanted to say that on the right of your screen, there, there's a place, or should be a place, for comments or questions, which we'll take at the very end. If it isn't there, then you'll see that there's a link to get you to a place where you can uh, put in some comments and questions, which we'll take up. But... We want to, you heard the, the, um, the music play at the very beginning? Yeah, theme song. Yes, Mark does all of our music. Any musical you've seen, almost every one of them, Mark has been music conductor, played in, and he's been such a pillar of our organization, musically speaking. And his wife, Louise Amalari, has been a remarkable performer for all of our fundraisers, and uh, she has an amazing career as an author, as, as an entrepreneur, uh, 17 years as a gymnast and a remarkable performer Speaker, in Rome. Absolutely. And we're thrilled to have them both with us today, ladies and gentlemen. Louise and Mark Camilleri. Here they come. Mm. Oh, there there they go. are. Hey. Hi, guys. Hey. How's it going? Hey. I now had we to have mention. Only 20 Sorry. minutes left of that huge long introduction. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Welcome, um, guys. Yeah, thank you. I, thank you. I had to mention the gymnast part because 17 years that's amazing. Long time, yeah, early years. And it's funny how some art, which is completely different from what you do for a living, contributes to what uh, your career. And we'll talk about that. But I mean, we're still, I think, in Toronto, stage two, we're not quite stage three of COVID. I just wanted to ask you a quick question what, um, what are you dying to do individually and maybe as a family? Once and and we, we this COVID thing is behind us and we can do our freedom is back a bit. What are you dying to do that you sort of haven't had a chance to? I think have people over. Yes, that's yeah. our that's our big thing. Have people over. Mm. We've had a few little groups of friends, but we mm. love to entertain. We love a big group in our home. We love to cook for people, and uh, you know we're always being very careful with our numbers and making sure. When we've had the five people over, okay, you're sitting over there, there, far away, far away. So to have everybody just just jam in the kitchen yeah. and uh, be together mm -hmm. freely would be great, I think. I hear you. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Yeah, for me, I think it's, I really miss all, and this sort of adds to what Louise is saying, but I really miss all my friends, even professionally, you know what I mean? Um, out on gigs and out on doing shows and, you know, grabbing lunch between rehearsals and hanging out with P with all, all my guys who are not only my favorite musicians to play with, but also my favorite people to hang out with. Um, right. And so you just, we all just sort of disappeared, you know, like we can't, 
we don't hook up anymore to play and and that brings us all together all the time you know so uh i know you start to feel soft after a while a little bit you know a little softer mushy around the edges because you sometimes you just lose that that creative um yes that creative edge you know yes, I, I think for sure, for sure. sometimes too yeah so, it's such a human thing contact yeah and, and, and it's such a simple thing and when we don't even appreciate it until it's missing yeah. How important it is in our life. You're 100. percent I can't wait to give someone a hug. Oh my yeah. God. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like something as simple as that, shaking someone's hand. You know what I mean? Like it, we're just not, we're not doing it. You know? Yeah. And uh, I just hope we, I just hope we don't lose this. You know, this want of the need to uh, embrace yeah. each other once it's all over. I hate, I hate to be think that it's, uh, it's going to dissipate again. It most likely will because that's human nature. But it would just be nice to have that train of thought to say how, how wonderful it is to have that human contact. You know. Yeah. So, so guys, uh, as we start a, a, a lot of these conversations, we want to go back, back to the beginning, and uh, mm -hmm. love oh. to talk about your childhood because people, you know, oh. that's the beginning. Where did you get that? Thing? Did you say that? <laughs> 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 yes, of course. No, we no, we randomly oh, kicked that. Wow. From the, oh, oh, too cute. Okay. Too cute. Oh my god. Oh my god. I love seeing baby pictures because no one really changes. <laughs> you know, you guys. Within the picture, you can see them. You see you guys. Oh, my oh my god. Oh my god. Oh, that's uh -oh. Funny. Yeah, yeah. Uh oh dear. Uh oh. If you did what I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so both your parents were um, immigrants. They basically came to, to, to Canada, right? Yeah, my Mark, Mark came, Louise. Yeah, oh, yeah. So my parents came from uh, through from Saint Lucia to England, and then uh, we came to Canada. My father was my mother was nursing in England. My father was a musician and uh, a soon to be music teacher in Canada, and that's when we came to Canada. So that's how we came through. Yeah, and for so, us, you were born here, Louise. No, I was born in England. Oh, very cool. Yeah, so my parents were in St. Lucia studying. They went to England, or living. They went to England to study. My mother, nursing. My dad, music. And then they married, uh, had me, and then we came to Canada. Cool. Yeah. So yeah. That's our story. And, uh, yeah, from my end, my parents are both from Malta. Um, and uh, my dad had come to Canada first uh, and uh lived here for a couple years i believe and then uh they went back to malta uh got married to my mom and then they both came here uh and then they had me here so i was born here uh i speak maltese it's sort of you know culturally i was raised maltese but uh yeah but i was born here how, how, do, you, how do you say well how, how do you say uh well, i, I we're gl i'm glad to be here in maltese um uh, at Nihu Gost, uh, in uh, Beshin Kunao, in Parlamakem. So I'm uh, having a great time here talking to the two of you. Wow. What, what language is it closest to? I would say the sort of the original language would be closest to Arabic, I would say. Right. Um, a lot, the, the modern language now uh, is sort of Italian slash, you know, English, I guess. But so a car is a carrozza. So that sounds very Italian then, you know what I mean? Right. But, uh, but uh, beautiful woman is Maratsabiha. You know what I mean? So then that sounds Arabic. You know, so it's a mishmash of everything. Being oh. that Volta was in the middle of the Mediterranean, surrounded by everybody, it got influence from everywhere. You know, so. Wow. Louise, do you speak Mal Do you speak any Maltese? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I took. Maltese. What swear words do you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's right. That's that's pretty much well, it. Or how do you know what your mother-in-law is saying about you? So I mean, <laughs> well, I took a Maltese classes <laughs> for that. Oh, good for you! And wow. our youngest, uh, he speaks it because he hangs out with the, the grandparents and everything. And um, so we both went to Maltese class, and so I know some things. I know how to say some words, and I know how to say, yeah, certain things. Certain <laughs> words. <laughs> there are words we don't want to say. Yeah, and. Uh, she knows just enough that we can't talk about her anymore. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, and um, like bouquet fiori is a, a a basket of flowers. There you go. <laughs> nice. Okay. Lovely. I know certain things that you learn in you know class in Maltese class, right. um, how to count and whatnot. So sure. that's about it. But I I can't speak it. Nice. Can speak it very well. He can speak to people. 
And yeah. Mark, you have a lot. You have a huge family. How many cousins and aunts and uncles? I mean, you. I know because they went back to Malta a couple of years ago and had a reunion with how many people? Yes, yeah. So we went back to Malta three summers ago. If yes. We count this yeah. summer. So uh, that was Louisa's first time going, and my first time going f since I was thirteen. Wow, or something. I think I was thirteen or fifteen the last time I went. Um, yeah, I think when we did the math, I have close to eighty cousins. Oh, wow. uh, yeah, eighty first cousins. Yeah, my mom is the oldest, second oldest of nine, and my dad. Some of course died very early, but my dad is the set. I believe he was ultimately the second youngest of fourteen. Yeah. Wow. wow. So were you always uh, both interested in your careers of uh, singing and 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 music, or, or what were the early inspirations? Um, oh yeah. Well, for me, I always was. Oh, oh, <laughs> really? <laughs> wow. There it is. Check it there out. My it first is. piano. Holy cow! In our old old house. Yeah. There uh, it is. Holy there. yeah. Oh, How old would I be there? I don't know. I mean, I can't. Five or six. So single yeah. digits, yeah. Yeah, single yeah. digits because my feet aren't even touching the floor. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, oh my God, that's funny. Blast. Oh, Where dude. did you find that? <laughs> um, uh, anyway, yeah. So, yeah, I started piano when I was four. Um, my parents took me to piano lessons. I don't, I don't think I asked for it or anything. I think my parents just put me in music lessons. So, uh, I had a good ear uh, at the very beginning my uh you know my teacher would play something i'd play it back she would sing something i would sing it back and so she said you know he looks like he has promise why not do some lessons with him or whatever i was always kind of a good quiet kid so you know i practiced i did my thing um i'm not sure how much i it wasn't necessarily a passion or anything yet um i practiced my dad would sit with me a lot and we would practice for half an hour every day you know doing that stuff it wasn't till um and on that piano that you just saw um and then uh i can't believe you found that picture um and then uh uh it wasn't until maybe grade seven grade six seven school that um i excelled pretty fast so uh by grade seven school, I was in my grade eight piano already. So it came really naturally to me. I think, I don't, I hate using the word prodigy and all that weird stuff, but like, I certainly, if YouTube was around, I would have been one of those little kids playing the Mozart. You know what I mean? Like that was what I did. So, um, uh, but it wasn't until grade seven, six, seven, when our school had a talent show. Um, I wasn't particularly sporty. I wasn't particularly, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't unpopular, but I wasn't a popular kid. You know, I wasn't the tallest. I was, you know, whatever. I was just an average dude. And, uh, but when they had the talent show, it made me unique after that. And everyone knew me for that. And that, that's when it was like, wow, this is kind of cool. Now I have, you know, there's that kid who's awesome at soccer. There's that kid who can skate and wow. there's me who can play piano, you know, and that sort of became my thing. And then I took band class and I learned sax within minutes because I could, oh my God, <laughs> really, <laughs> really? Wow. There he is. You said it. <laughs> oh my God. Anyway, there I am playing sax. So, oh God. Really? Wow. So, anyway, yeah. So, so you know, I mean, it came really easy at that point, you know. So, uh, yeah. So that's where it sort of became an interest for me and something that I enjoyed doing. And Louise. Yeah. <laughs> No. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> no. Well, for me, um, I was a youngster in school, and apparently the, the teachers used to call my parents in and say, please put her into something because she's doing cartwheels in the halls and she's jumping around and dancing in the hallways. So they put me into gymnastics. So that was my first thing. And um, I, I, I loved it. I, I gravitated to it right away. And my best event was the floor exercise because I would do my routine and I would get applause. And I was mm. like, hey, I love this sound. And then, uh, so then, you know, dancing was the next thing uh, I went into. But um, my parents always told me as a kid that I would watch people like Sammy Davis Jr. and I would watch um, Brishnikov and, and you know, all these old sitcoms and, and the shows and that people would be performing in. And I would just go insane for the dancing. I'd pick it up and I'd, I'd do it. So dance was really my first thing, um, uh, big event. But I never went to school for it. I went to school for gymnastics. That was my serious thing. I think my parents thought I was going to be a gymnast or, or you know, a coach or something at the end of the day because I was uh, training, you know, at Olympic level uh, in right. gymnastics. And then um, I left that for performance. And, and then my first audition ever was for Canada's Wonderland. Oh. So that, 
And uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yikes! And she was singing. Oh, yes, yes. Was wow! First show that was uh, in concert '87 in the outdoor show. Yeah. Wow. And then I I went into the indoor. <laughs> later on but um, I guess after a while I mean you have to be a triple threat I mean you're a singer you're a dancer you're an actor I mean I guess you survive in this country too you have to do I mean so when you discovered you had this beautiful voice that, from dance or did you no I think that was from actually my father my father uh being a musician I grew yeah. up listening to him playing you know his trumpet and guitar and I would always harmonize to his exercises, he'd be playing things, and then he'd yell at the top of his lungs, "Stop doing that!" <laughs> in the house, because I would be hard, I'd be singing that da, 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 little scales, whatever. And so harmony, I, I, I think I developed my ear from that. And then he um, let me hear people like Barbara Streisand, Cleo Lane, wow. like mm -hmm. all the amazing singers, um, uh, Sarah Vaughan. Like I just would sing to these women all the time, even Anne Murray, Karen Carpenter. I love these voices, and I, that's where I would kind of practice. And Wonderland was my first experience auditioning and getting there. Yeah. So how did how did theater come to you both? Theater? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Your love of musical theater, your love of being in this business. Yeah, then school, going to school and doing theater in school. Um, after I auditioned for Wonderland and did that for a few years, then I did the cruise ships. And mm. there, after that, so I was performing there. <laughs> there she yeah. is. Oh, my God. Oh, <laughs> wow. Okay, that's on the, the ocean. Oh, yikes. That was on Holland America. <laughs> so, yikes. And dare I say, after that, um, I went to New York and... Uh, auditioned and my first show was Showboat. So I got that and I was doing that in New York. So there, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah, so that's the Charleston. That's from uh, the Charleston dance in uh, Showboat. And that was your first And that was your first show? For first yeah. impression of the show? That was my, yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. The beginning. Wow, Amazing. what a great story to cut your teeth on with Hal Prince and was that with yeah. the lady? Elaine Stritch and Bobby Morse and uh, right. wow, yeah, all the all the biggies, yeah, they were absolutely amazing. Rebecca Luther <laughs> and Mark Jacoby, like wow. yeah, great names. And uh, did you know these people before? No, 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 no. no. You, you hadn't known them. Before. Oh no, 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 I had known them. Wow. And I uh, put a uh, birth into the business. Lynette McKee was in that too, so yeah. Who's this? Lynette McKee. She was our. Oh teacher. sure, yes. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. And musical theater is sort of the inspiration of your love and your life together. If you can take us through the story of how you guys met with through a musical theater audition, it's fascinating, and, and here we are today. You want us to fight on screen right now. You want us to fight about how we do it. You, know, you might have differing, uh, yeah, different story. perspectives of it. Yes, yeah. definitely different. <laughs> Who's going first? You going first or am I going first? Okay, so I'll go first. <laughs> the true story is that I had just come back from New York and uh, I had all my music organized and I had all the stuff together and I was going to audition in Toronto and I thought I was the ish. Anyway, so I went in for this audition for Suds. Uh, this is out of Sterling, right? Yes, yeah. With Caroline with Smith. With Caroline Smith, yeah. And um, so I've got this great jazz piece. So I walk into the room and I see this kid behind the piano and he's got this long kind of rock on hair and these, these bracelets and uh, all of a sudden I'm like, oh, nuts. this guy is just going to be, you know, I don't know what he's going to play for my, my song. So I go over to him and I say, okay, so can you do this? And they always say, you've got to tell the piano player how you want your music. So I was telling him where I wanted it to swing here and can you do this here and do that, whatever. And he looks at me with this attitude of like, lady, please. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, this is gonna be awful. So I go over and then we're, we're, we, he, we start and he was great. I was like, yeah, and he's giving me all the swing and all this stuff, all the push beats I wanted. We ended, uh, bam. And I was like, great. And I walk over and I'm like, oh, geez, thanks so much. That was great. And he still has an attitude. He looks at me like, whatever. I just like, wow. I'll never get this gig. And um, 
but I got it. <laughs> and then, uh, but we weren't, we were with other people at that time. And we met many years later and uh, the right place, the right time in Mamma Mia. And that's when uh, we were both free and he asked me out and uh, mm, the rest right. is history. Yeah, that's one really perspective. That's one yeah. perspective yeah. of how it worked out. Um, you're close though, you're close. Oh, um, so yeah, so yeah, in comes Louise. She comes, she walks over with the music. Now she's absolutely correct in that you need to talk to your accompanist, especially if they're not somebody who you play with regularly and make sure you explain the music. But because she had judged me based on my hair, hair. and <laughs> the way I was dressed or whatever, it was literally like explaining, okay, so this is a bar and this is what I need. And this is what, and it was like talking down. And it was like, why is, why is she just, this is, just this, all the this is just the standard, whatever, go sing, we'll be fine. And so so after all this, I'm like, I'm gonna show her. And I, I remember your intro was like two bars. I played some eight bar intro, all flashy to set up everything. To mess and, me uh, yeah. up, to mess me up. <laughs> and so I do this thing and I played my butt off um, thinking whatever. But as soon as she started to sing, I had the same opinion. I was like, oh wow, she can actually sing though, this is good. And so by the end of the tune, both of us kind of looked at each other like, hmm. All right, this is, this is okay. Um, but uh, anyway, yeah, it was a very funny. We totally remember the. I can remember the room. I can remember. Yeah, everything. yeah, yeah. Remember everything. Yeah, you walked in from over there, and you get yes, totally. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. I was. It was a long time ago. Like it was one of my first shows I music directed to. Maybe first or second show. Um, my first real theater gig was with the Mantini Sisters, um, right. who I still play with today. Like whatever, mm -hmm. 30, 20 years later. Um, and uh, anyway. Um, so it was, it was really early, early. So um, I don't know how old I would have been, 22 or something. Um, but uh, anyway, I was But you fun. fell in love right I fell there. in love right away, yeah. Right there. Right. That's so cool. Hey, so uh, that whole rehearsal process, every break and every chance we had, we'd always sing jazz standards. Yeah, we'd yeah. always sing together. So yeah, yeah, it was good. It was good. Can you, can you talk, can you explain to uh, people who are watching it is, uh, what a musical director does? I mm -hmm. mean... Uh, because, you know, people see MD, they see musical director, but I mean, it's hard enough to explain what an actor does, but yeah. you know, what does, what does a musical director do? Okay. So what does a musical director do? So, um, the cre a creative team usually, usually, uh, on a musical involves three, I don't know, leadership position departments, whatever. Um, as far as the creative team goes, there's a director. There's a choreographer and there's a music director. Now, I think as a choreographer, um, that's probably the easiest job to understand because you're teaching people what the dance is. So it's a very simple thing to explain. So the music director is pretty much the same thing as a choreographer, except instead of movement, we are dealing with the sound of the show so or the music. Uh, so my job in on a musical is uh, A, to hire the you know if we're going all the way back to the audition process the very very beginning of a show um the first thing we will do is uh, audition actors and it's my job to weigh in on their ability to sing so if somebody comes in who's a killer dancer um the choreographer will say oh they're perfect they have to be in the show but if they can't sing in tune or whatever then that becomes my department to you know ixnay that person and say they can't do it or vice versa i might someone might come in and sing awesome and whatever so my job is to with the creative team make sure that the music department is in a good state for the show so that musically the show can happen um uh, so that's the first step the second step then i have to teach all the music and teaching the music isn't just you know teaching the songs but also organizing who the cast is and figuring out who's a soprano who's an alto um dealing with things like um you know Louise can't be in this song because uh, she'll be doing a quick change backstage and therefore she can't sing. So I'm going to lose a voice. So I need to then deal with how I'm going to accommodate that voice missing. And a lot of the time, it's not one person doing a costume change. It may be three people doing a costume change. And so uh, getting ready for the next scene. And so I got to, so that there's that element to the job. Um, there is obviously knowing the score and playing rehearsal. So there's a big chunk of that where I'm not teaching, I'm just the accompanist in the room um, for the dancers to teach the music. So can we take that four bars or that two counts of eight and play it? I'll play it slow while they learn it. I play it fast as we get to the right tempos, all that kind of stuff. It's also my responsibility to keep track of the music from an orchestration standpoint, because most choreographers truthfully don't, especially if it's a new show, don't know the music 
like it, as detailed as I would know it, just as much as I would know the choreography. So it's my job through the process to say, listen, the drummer does this here. So you might want to know because it might be fun to catch that little bit of, you know, instrumentation in your dance. Um, or there's, uh, you know, a big brass thing that happens or something. And then, you know, you may want to catch that with whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so it's my job to make sure I'm on top of all of that. Cool. Um, and then, you know, if it's a show with, you know, a, a, a huge budget, you know, and, and whatever else, then, then, you know, I'm booking the orchestra, we're doing rehearsal. But on many shows, like, um, uh, we, we have to scale the orchestra down. So obviously when we did Funny Girl, we had the privilege of having the entire orchestra. That was amazing. But when we were on a show like, um, you know, so the yeah. Jazz, for example, or even, uh, yeah, or, or, or To Life or whatever, um, we had to shrink the, the band size down to accommodate, you know, our budget and our theater size and all that stuff. So then it becomes my job to arrange the show and make sure that, you know, the parts make sense. Um, and then, I, you know, and then the only other department I work with a lot is the sound department, just to make sure they understand what's going on, who's singing what, and the sound of the show that we want to have, you know. Um, and what's that's the, can and they, then we up to running or maintaining the show. Can an, can an artist, let's say Louise comes up to you in the middle of a, say, I, I as an actor don't um, uh, feel that the arc of the, I mean, if, that I don't feel that the song is going where I need to take it for my character. Does she have collaboration with you? Or yeah, can, well, you can know. I as a director come to you and say, I don't feel this is working. I need, I need this to feel it. And so does that come into play? Yeah, that's you, really comes into the arc and, and say that? Would yeah, you... so it certainly comes into play in a new musical. If right. we're putting on West Side Story, the show is the show. Uh, you know what right. I mean? You gotta do what you gotta do. Um, we, we're not gonna rewrite Maria. You know what I mean? It's not right. gonna happen. But, but if we're talking about a new show, like uh, like The Jazz Singer, um, for sure, Tim and I, and some of the actors after, especially, you know, we didn't really have a workshop for that show. We sort of rehearsed it and up it went and so there were times where we'd hear a song and realize hmm, maybe it's maybe it's too long maybe we need to cut this at this point of the show or um or the actor would have the opposite it's like you know what i feel like i'm getting into it and as soon as i start you know feeling where i need to be the song ends so can we add another verse or can we repeat something or what you know what i mean so absolutely on new shows that happens all the time and it's that's probably the toughest job of a music director or or supervisor or, or you know arranger is <clears throat> sometimes a request literally is one sentence and that one sentence of can we do a repeat and maybe have a key change turns into 19 hours on my mm -hmm. end to reorchestrate the thing and to you know what I mean like it's a so that and of course opening night doesn't move and rehearsal tomorrow is going to happen. And if that's on the schedule, it needs to be done by tomorrow. So that's probably the hardest part on shows like the jazz singer on shows, yeah. like, um, you know, new shows, new shows. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, again, we put on West side story. It's there. You know what I mean? Like you might tweak something for a scene change or whatever, but, but on brand new shows, uh, yeah. that's a, that's a whole thing for sure. It's a, it's a big job. Yeah. Louise, you were with in Mamma Mia for three years. Yes, yeah. And Mark, you were also playing for three years, or? Yes. Yeah, so I came on, I came on as a sub. So what a sub is is um, there's the regular. There were four keyboards on that show, and when the regular guy was going to take a day off or a or a week off or was had something else, a sub would come in and play their shot their part. And so I started out. I totally went up the ladder on that one. So I started as a sub. That was my first. Oh big show in Toronto. Um, so I came on as a sub. And then when SARS hit Toronto and Mamma Mia went to Vancouver, um, I was brought on as uh, as a regular because one of the people on the show couldn't stay on. And so I came on the show and I was also asked to conduct it. Um, so I was going to be the third conductor. So I, went out to Vancouver, I learned the show there. I came back. And then later on in the show, I became from assistant conductor to associate music director. So and did you both do a PF Dietrich show together as well? We did. Yeah. yeah. Um but you were yeah. what were you on that one? You were just the uh for that one I only only yeah. I only orchestrated it and uh and I, I did? Uh, yeah and yeah. <laughs> I know whatever but and and I orchid and I uh contracted the musicians. Yeah. So uh so I booked all the musicians and sort of took care of all the behind the scenes stuff with their subbing and their rehearsal schedules and all that kind of stuff. Has it been seamless working together as a married couple in these circumstances or does sometimes being a married couple for whatever reason uh and working have some effect either with the other cast members or with yourselves? 
Well, you know what? I will say, because when we worked in Mamma Mia, and I was the dance captain, and uh, Mark was associate at that time, um, we had to work together when we put new cast members in the show. And we have found that we have always been able to work together very well. That's one mm -hmm. thing we can, without a doubt, do really well. And we're able to teach together. We used to teach at Randolph. We teach a cabaret mm -hmm. class together. We really do work together very, very well. There hasn't been, you know, I mean, our life comes in when we joke and tease each other and people love it and they laugh, whatever the kids used to laugh uh, in, in class. But um, we've never had a problem working because we're two separate departments. You know, we're not going to step on either person's toes or anything. And I truly, as the um, the dance captain, have to listen to how the music goes. And Mark would then say, okay, give me a cue word for that move. So next time you go to it to teach the person, I'll know what it is. And he'd write down little cues. It was also because he was trying to impress me. He loved me and everything, you know. But um, so, but we would always like really want to, you know, help the person. Like we really work well together. I think. Work came first. Yeah. Just, you go more and more. Yeah. 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 We do yeah. our best when we're together. I think. Yeah. yeah. Oh, very cool. You yeah. know, you know, and you, with these interviews, you start talking. You want, and you want to bring up so many things. I, I'd like to skip ahead a little. I mean, I know you both have. Uh, you were married before, right, Louise? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, you were not, right? Or but no, but so Louise, I know um, your first, your son. You have two beautiful kids. I mean, Andrew and Adrian. We'll yes. meet Adrian a little later. I think it's fantastic. But your son Andrew, <clears throat> born with a. Um, well, if you can explain it, because it, mm. it, cause it was the first of its kind in this in Canada or in the country or North America, that he had this rare disease or yes, yes. So he was born um, in liver failure because he had um, neonatal hemochromatosis, which just means an overload of iron in his liver. So, uh, and we didn't know my first husband and I. We didn't know Andrew came out and he just was not well. And you know jaundice and all the signs for this disease. It took um, about two weeks to get him diagnosed. Finally, at Sick Kids Hospital, which is the best hospital in the world, we're so lucky to have it. Mm -hmm. here. And um, took him in, and they said basically he needs a liver transplant because there was so much iron in his liver. The iron actually scarred his liver. Had there just been iron they could have maybe taken it out or had they known earlier they could have you know had mris and everything and done something but there was so much it scarred his liver that's why his whole body was not functioning he wouldn't have made it so when they said that to me it was like saying you have a child from mars it just kind of goes over your head you know and he was so tiny they said okay here's what we can do we can either uh, wait for a cadaveric liver, which means uh, another child to pass away and donate a liver. Um, or we can, we have this new procedure called um, a living donor and you can do this for your son. So I immediately was like, yes, I'll do it. Um, and uh, I got worked up. They had to work me up first to make sure we were a match. We luckily were a match. And they said, okay, we just have you as a secondary thing. We're going to look for a cadaveric liver first. But because Andrew was brand new, a little baby, usually if, um, you know, a little babies pass away, parents aren't too eager to, you know, donate parts as such. It's not like adults, which is a different thing. We sign our donor cards, you know, and our license and whatnot. Um, so we were waiting and waiting. And then it got to a point where we couldn't wait any further because um, cadaveric livers weren't coming in and Andrew was not going to make it another day. Mm. So then they said, okay, we're going to go. And um, at the time he was 12 weeks old and I was in uh, the operation for uh, 12 hours and they took um, the left lobe of my liver. So that was the smallest piece they could take the fullest part that they could take. And he was in a, uh, the hospital for 14 hours his operation was 14 hours and they put my left lobe into him and they attached the hepatic vein and portal vein and as much as they could and uh and that was it and then uh when i was healing in the, in the hospital they said to me you know as soon as you're able we'll, we'll go over and we'll take you over so at the time we were at sick kids in toronto general 
and they, I was ready. I was like, okay, four days later, I want to see my baby. And they wheeled me under the little thing there. That's how they took the liver over as well. They had it in the cooler. They took it under the mm. little pad. And I went into the room and I remember <laughs> seeing these uh, four, there were four children in the ICU. And I'm looking for my, at the time, my jaundiced green baby. Cause they said to me, you know, don't be too anxious. You know, it takes a while for the jaundice and for your new liver to clear all the stuff out of him. So I'm looking and I see this Andrew's little toy. He had a toy little worm. And I remember going, why does that child have Andrew's toy? You know, like, hmm. what are they doing? You know, you're not supposed to share things because of germs in a hospital and with these precious transplant babies. And so they wheeled me over and I'm seeing this child and he was the same color as me. He wasn't green. I was looking for my green baby and he was my color. And I looked over and it was my kid. And I have a picture at the back of the, the book that I wrote about it um, of him. And I'm just like, I, I just couldn't believe like it had, he had cleared. And, uh, and then they, that was, that was it. And everything was they told me, you know, uh, don't, we don't know how this is going to go. Cause everybody's different. There are sometimes post, you know, op problems. But they said he might need another liver when he's six. He might need one when he's 17. We have no idea. We'll just follow you as you go. And today he is 19 turning 20. That's so, amazing. Yeah. There. there he is right there. What a handsome young man. DJ. Yeah. There yeah. you go. Wow. Yeah. You're, you're such a great advocate for him. I remember, you, I mean, you're short circuiting the story. I mean, <laughs> I remember I heard it before. It's remarkable what you did to make sure that everything went right. And you also have another narrative in your life because of the health, you, you're you and writing books about it. You also have your own as an entrepreneur, um, LC um, Cosmetics, which is unique in that it's a very healthy version in the cosmetic yeah. world. Do you wanna talk about that and starting a business? And well, when um, when they sent me home with um, you know a, a bag full of medicine for Andrew, all these things, they said basically he's got to stay germ free and preservative free and and as clean as possible because everything we ingest from our skin inside our mouths you know, to our bodies goes through the liver. I learned so much about the liver and the mm -hmm. over six hundred functions that it does, and I had to take care of my son and myself. So from all the research I did, I realized, okay, I've got to feed him a certain way. I can't put every lotion and potion on his body because it has chemicals, it has ingredients that can hurt his liver. So how do I keep him clean? Well, necessity is the mother of invention. I had to end up making my own. So I studied um, aromatherapy. I studied uh, reflexology to learn the body systems and everything. I, I, I luckily had a bit of a nursing background uh, in my life. And uh, so I understood biology and healthcare. And uh, my mother is also a reflexologist and, and my family is all about that. So I just learned everything I could. And then I ended up making his little diaper ointment. I made his skin creams. I made everything for him and as well as feeding him properly and, and for me as well. So everything that I use from head to toe is clean stuff. That's not going to tax the body and tax the liver with toxins to hurt either one of us. So that's how it started. It really was, um, so it's called LC Natural because <laughs> uh, it's all natural stuff that I make. And I could eat the products myself. Wow. Because People can go have, online and, and purchase it, LC Naturals? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or under, just uh, and look under Louise Camilleri and it's, uh, it's all there. Mark, what's your, your favorite soap to eat? <laughs> oh, <my God>. <laughs> <laughs> You guys are the best cooks too. I mean, yes, please, you've been baking so much. And Mark, I mean, you, I, I, I love how you find solace and you find such, you, you love to cook. It's a, it's a passion yeah. for you both, right? I love it too that he loves to cook because out of nowhere, one time he just, I don't know what we were going through in life or just, you know, whatever. He just said, I need to find a Zen. I need to find something to just Zen out. I think of the way you were doing a lot of work and yeah. a lot of arranging and stuff and just music and all that he has to do. And he just wanted to find something totally different. And he just picked up a cookbook and just started cooking. And I don't cook anymore. Wow. <laughs> yeah, go. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, I love it. It's so um, it, it's <laughs> crazy. So it's cool. You know what I mean. So that's cool. But uh, and I love food. God, I love to eat. And um, 
and yeah, so I don't know. I just started every, you know, you like the food and I liked cooking it. And so, um, sort of Italian style, you know, I mean, I of, get but, risotto on demand. Mm -hmm. I get steaks, I get pastas. I get, I've asked, he makes hummus now, guac. He makes like, yeah. anything. If I just go, I just feel like this. He's like, okay, hold on. And he'll go and make it. Yeah. So yeah, it's awesome. That, and it started to take up gardening now too. Uh, uh, Cause now wow. with free time we have, cause there are no more gigs anymore at the present moment. Um, yeah, so and that that I do mostly with Adrian. Actually, uh, we're always out every morning, watering everything, talking to all the plants, seeing all the new mm -hmm. stuff grow. Uh, and it's amazing how much it changes every day <laughs> when you go out there. It's like, look, a new flower or uh, whatever. So we've been enjoying that too. And uh, but he grows our own basil. Like he grows all that to put as ingredients into the food. So oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, yeah. you uh, make Maltese dishes? What are some Maltese dishes that we might not have heard of that are wonderful? Yeah. So Maltese dishes. So. Um, uh, Malta is really big into pastries and desserts. That's a huge thing there. Uh, the meals themselves are the meals themselves, whatever. There is a couple of things here and there, but um, they love rabbit stew. That's a big one. Um, uh, and uh, pastas and stuff. But uh, desserts are really awesome. And uh, the fast food of Malta, I guess, would be something called pastizzi, which are um, flaky pastry stuffed with ricotta or stuffed with... Uh, Bring it on. You know, <laughs> they are so good. My mom makes them. Um, there are a lot of, I haven't made those yet. Uh, there are a lot of work. It's a whole it's a commitment. It's a lot work. of work. Yeah. And then you end up with like 700 of them when you're finished. So oh, it's no. a whole other thing. But, uh, and they're buttery and they're, they're like, they're like, you know, kind of a spanakopita ish from that, you know. Um, or flaky, like a croissant, like, you know, that croissant, the flakes of a croissant. Yes. Oh, yes. Nice. yes. A mishmash of all that stuff. Yeah. They're, Amazing. Every every time I make them with when people are over, they're they're gone. Yeah. Uh, and we live in a sort of Maltese area here, so there's a couple of bakeries that have them frozen. If you're oh. you know you, you need to pick up a dozen fast because you're having people over. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so yeah, that's for sure the biggest thing. Yeah. Hey, listen, just before we bring before your we son, on, I just wanted to ask you work with so many famous people, Mark. You both have, um, and uh, with through the concert series, and if you can want to yeah. name. Just a, a, a few and, and your, your impression of them. Oh man, sure. Uh, so, um, okay, so uh, Andrea Bocelli, I was I was privileged to work with him. Um, that was a really, I'll be really fast. Uh, that was a really funny gig um, <laughs> because he was supposed to play piano on the show. And so uh, there was a song that I didn't have to play. So. Um, then they told me later on, can you play the song and just fill around what he's doing so that, you know, it sounds a little fuller. And I'm like, oh, okay, sure. So, uh, he was never at rehearsal, of course. So we do it. The day of the show comes and they set up the piano that he's facing the audience. So his hands aren't seen. And right before, like seconds before the song, a cameraman, this was at the ACC or the ACC, yeah, Scotia Bank, whatever. Yeah, it was so the ACC. Say, so we're in the in the audience, and we're watching. I'm with Mark's parents, and uh, we're watching Mark. Uh, he's way down there. We're seeing Andre Bocelli, and they bring out the piano, and he's playing, and we're like, "Wow, he's playing piano!" And then all of a sudden, the camera pans behind Mark, and Mark's just and you know, all you there. see is this. The camera guy was broadcasting. My <laughs> Andre didn't play. His hands hovered above the keys, like he never touched them. Oh my God! And, and they filmed my hands to be oh. as if they were his, except of course I'm wearing jewelry <laughs> and, <laughs> and <laughs> rings and Those everything. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> You know, yeah. oh, it was the fun, and the camera guy was right there. Oh, like, wow, that's funny. Anyway, so that's my Andrea Bocelli story. Um, Sting recently, I worked with for about eight weeks with yeah. um, what's it called? He was an awesome, the, awesome the last ship. on the last ship. Yeah, uh, awesome guy. Like, just Denver. one of one of the one of the guys. Like, you know, he yeah. came in, you know, and everything stopped. We shook his hand, you know, at rehearsal, and then he just became one of the guys. And we were making fun of each other. A backstage story. Um, uh, I hadn't seen him for a couple of days after we did the first rehearsal and then two days went by. I didn't see him. And then the th whatever, I walked down the hallway and he sees me and he's like, Hey, good to see you again. He says to me and he goes, I'm sorry. I've met so many people. He goes, what's your name again? He says to me and I'm like, Oh, it's Mark. I said, no problem. I said, and I'm glad you broke the ice. Cause what's your name? <laughs> and he turns to me and says, Lionel Richie. That's the name. that he <laughs> So for eight weeks, it wow. would be, Hi, Mark, I Lionel. 
Like, oh. oh yeah, so he was a really cool guy. Um, Marvin Hamlish, uh, he used to call me Mr. Toronto. Right. Um, every time he came, there was a span there of about maybe five, six years. Every time he came to Toronto, I would be on the gig somehow. And so uh, we became friends. I would go to New York and he would, I would call him up and he'd take me to his favorite bagel place. Oh, um, wow. And uh, we'd have a bagel together. Oh, uh, awesome. Um, who else? Uh, the, with the Canadian tenors, I was brought down to Chicago, uh, and I was on the Oprah show playing with them. Wow. And oh, Dion was the special guest. So okay. I got to rehearse with her without wow. the tenors knowing it was a surprise. Uh, she's super hyper, but she's, oh my God. She sounds exactly like her recordings, and she's right there. It's like, I don't know how how you have reverb and all this, you know, it's amazing. So, yeah, I've been really lucky to work with some great guys. Um, can, you, can you talk about, before we bring on your son, I, I just want to just touch base with your relationship to Temple Sinai, your relationship to being the Jewish community, because you both, Mark, you do, you play high holidays and services, and, you know, and Louise, you've done so much for Temple Sinai, and, mm -hmm. and I, I'd love to know your relationship to or your feelings toward the culture and Judaism and what what's attracted you to be with them and their attraction to you as performers or, you know, what you give to that community. Can you talk for a couple of minutes about that? Yeah, like I wanted to convert. I really <laughs> did. Because um, I love the study. For me, it's the study. I love mm -hmm. the study, the discussion, I, I, I the search. You know, I, I've always loved that. And I love talking to rabbis about that. Um, so that's that's what it is for me. Uh, I've had Shabbos dinner uh, here at, at the house. I have the, the candles. Uh, I've made challah bread myself. All that. So, yeah, I would totally do it tomorrow. <laughs> there. There you have it. There you have there it. There I said it. Um, yeah, it's been, it's, it's, it's been really cool to discover um, – a, the sense of community that exists yeah. at Temple Sinai um, that I've never seen anywhere, like any, anywhere else in that kind of setting. Um, uh, the amount of programs that happen that are going on all the time. The, um, uh, the uh, yeah, that's that's really awesome to see. And how many people go after service, you know, and and have bagel and 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 you know, just socialize like it's it's yeah. it's really cool um it's been amazing how welcoming everyone there has been yeah. um like i have so many friends there who after we finish service come and we talk and we you know what i mean like it's it, that's been awesome um and also the uh the importance of music in the surf is really was really interesting you know i mean i've gotten used to it i guess now with everything but but uh that was really interesting like i, I remember when i did my first service my first bar mitzvah service um we had a rehearsal um because i had never seen the music before and it was in a little rough shape because everyone you know adding music and taking stuff out and you know everyone taking their own notes so i had we had a rehearsal and i got handed a binder that was about an inch thick and i said okay so which songs are we doing and they're like no no that is the service it was a <laughs> <laughs> i was like you guys do this much music like you know being wow. happy, you know the opening the closing the communion you know i mean like there's like four songs you play and a couple little things but this was you know and they're epic pieces yeah. it's also amazing uh, i can go on forever but uh it's also amazing how uh alive the that the, the music is like as far as um songs are still being composed songs are mm -hmm. you know I mean? like, and how important it is that like you know uh cantor charles uh is composing for the high holidays or composing songs for whatever and uh it's really awesome that it's it's fresh and it's you know what I mean you're not singing the same song every you know yeah. right. it's a living breathing thing yeah, yeah. it really really yeah. really and uh, I never I mean I sort of always knew that to a certain degree but being there now as often as well, I am well when you play our shows too or our fundraisers yeah. too you might feel that sense of community also yes 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 yes, yes. yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, yes, it, uh, it's an honor to be an honorary Jew. Yes, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, listen, uh, one of my favorite people is your son, Adrian. <laughs> I look. Oh my <laughs> God! Oh, <laughs> gorgeous picture. You know, oh, he looks a little uh, nervous there. Yeah, yeah. I. I <laughs> oh my God! There's that a little. Now. Yes. Yeah. Oh, now. Look, I tell you. Uh, you've been over to our uh, mine and Kev's house for dinner, the three of you and such, and um, and 
to we sit at the table and he he talks and he he's not afraid to jump into a to conversation and he has his own opinion. So I know I saw his shadow back. Oh, no, yes, I saw the other. Come on in. Come on in. Come on in. Come on in. Great to have, have you. you. Look at that. Oh, what a great family. picture. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Uh, you guys really yeah. found the pictures, eh? Holy. How, How you are doing, you doing, Good. How are you? Good. How you been dealing with the COVID? What's been, you know, has it been tough for you and stuff? Well, not seeing my friends is a big thing, but mm -hmm. I had a couple of friends over, and two of my school friends live on my street. So I've yeah. been talking with them a bunch. Oh, that's cool. Oh, that's good. That's cool. Hey, I know you. Your your folks take you um all the all the time to theater and stuff. Do you, do you, is this something that you might want to do uh, in the future? Or music? Yeah, probably because uh since COVID, I've been taking on trumpet. My dad has been teaching me trumpet. Wow. Um, and we've had a a performance on our lawn. Like a whole street came and I played three songs and it was really fun. That is amazing. Yeah. Wow. What, what, is that your favorite what, instrument? Is trumpet? Pardon me? How many instruments can you play? Well, so in school I played violin for a bit and recorder. And when I was a kid, I would just bang on the bongos. <laughs> very good. Wow. So um, Louise and Mark, couple your ears for a sec. Uh-oh. Oh, uh -oh, dear. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> okay, Adrian, this is the time to tell us. What's it like being stuck with your parents during COVID? <laughs> Not going to school, but hey, you're you're not supposed to listen to guys in the back. <laughs> What's it really like? It's it's half and half. Yeah. <laughs> There's okay, a gentleman you know, I guess. What, 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 half and half. What's what's one half? What's the other? There's lots of good things, but then also being stuck with them for this long is it's a very interesting experience. Yeah. Yes. Okay, guys, you can plug your ears and stuff, you know? It is unique for everybody. And I guess hopefully it will uh, be come and go. But yeah. in our lifetime, this is quite an amazing experience for, for us. Yeah. yeah. How many of these uh, driveway concerts have you done? Uh, just one. Right. Yeah. But oh, something cool. if I can mention really interesting that Adrian's been doing with his buddies, um, because of the whole thing not being able to see friends in the, in the beginning, there was a new boy who moved across the street from us. So Adrian would write a letter and oh. put it in his mailbox. And the new kid would you know, introduce himself and he would uh, send the letter back. And Adrian sent letters to his friends and they would play like, you know, this kind of, you know, walking back and forth and taking a few days to actually write letters, not just text each other, but write. And That's amazing. Wow. Kind of, you know, get back to talking. Now they can kind of be together and they go scootering and stuff. But at first when you couldn't go near anybody, they'd just be dropping letters to each other. So that was a nice thing. I love, I love the fro. I, I, Matt's backstage. Matt, can you come say hi? Our general manager, Matt Birnbaum. There he is. There he is. Hey. Hello, everybody. Do you, have, do you have a picture of uh, Mark's fro? Oh, do I ever. Oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah. oh wow. Those are, those are oh, oiled locks. Mark, <laughs> where, look at that. Oh, yeah. wow. It's like I have a raccoon on the back of my. There he oh, is. Oh, yes. Yeah. Recordia. Wow. Adrian, yeah. Adrian, when you see your dad like that, what do you think with all that hair? That was crazy. This I know where it comes from. But <laughs> <laughs> At one time or another, he had some. Yeah. Oh, my God. That's that's great. Well, I, that's how I. That's when I met you, Mark. You had your. You had these long. It had a life of its own, man. I had to plan my schedule around when I was going to wash it, when my gig was, how to dry it, how to... Oh, it was a whole thing. Thank God I don't have it anymore. <laughs> did you just when did you up, work? Did you fall off one night or did you cut it off and... Uh... Yeah, so I... So, so I started realizing I was starting to thin and I was like, that. no, I'm not going to be that guy who's got, you know, whatever. So I literally cut it short like maybe an inch or something, you know what I mean? Whatever. Um, and donated it to sick kids. Um, oh. And sick kids made a bunch of wigs for children who were going through chemo and were going through all sorts of stuff. And I, rem <laughs> I remember bringing a paper bag, which was very weird. But anyway, I showed up with a paper bag with <laughs> in, a, in a ponytail that got cut off. And I went to them and said, you know, I have hair to donate. Okay, sure, let's see what you have. And I remember when I pulled it out of the bag, the woman screamed. I think <laughs> an animal came out of the bag. 
was the funniest thing. She goes, oh, my God. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's funny. Well, listen, Adrian, thanks, thanks for joining us, you know, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll have to see you soon, okay? Awesome. Okay, you know. Bye. Bye. I just wanted to ask quickly, when did, when did um, you and Mark meet and Louise? Sorry, sorry? What show did you and, and Avery work on did, oh, when you first met? Oh, well, we did a show, I think, Ave, I think it was Broadway Villains. I think so, that David Rogers put together. Exactly, yeah. So David Rogers, another awesome performer, um, uh, would do these little shows, put these shows together. They weren't really cabarets, but they were shows anyway. And uh, it was this thing around Halloween. I can't even remember. It was like in the Ottawa area or something we did it, right? I don't remember. Right? All I remember, Louise, is I went to him with my music and he gave me attitude. You so, think? You, you know, think? Right yeah. away. So I said, this, this is it, you know? Hey, listen, guys. Before we, um, before we actually we have, one question. We have one question, oh, sorry. yeah, we have one question from our audience. Oh, okay. Um, that's gonna put it up. Ilana Lazar, do guys have to be bald or balding to get into HEJTC? Well, <laughs> Ilana, for your information, we have full afros, we shave this every day, yes, yeah. exactly. That's right, that's right. Yeah, we have oh to keep God. a certain, certain look. I know. We look like brothers. I love it. I know. You guys have been extraordinary to our theater company. You know, I, I love it when when colleagues turn into friends and we've broken bread together and have had dinners together. And that's that's the bonus, you know. That's the bonus of knowing you both there. Look at that beautiful Yay. picture. La familia. That's familia. Yeah. Oh, oh geez. Wow, look, that's at that. a long time. <laughs> look at that hair. That's your point, yeah. Oh, that's oh, wow. like what a great picture. That's yeah, our, that's our concerts. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh yes. really? That's what you're yeah. saying. Yeah. Oh my God. God. That's our wedding. The funny thing is, every one of these. Oh my. Yes. Really? That's what. Yes. That's a, there's that's some ads for cologne. Like oh my God, you're gorgeous, Louis. Oh my God, beautiful pictures. That's oh, great. Thanks. We got married on a cruise ship. That was our I wedding. See. Wow. Yeah. Just gorgeous. Oh, man. Yeah. Thanks. And it's funny because it was just our anniversary a couple days ago. Oh, happy anniversary. And my birthday's coming up, oh. and Mark is going to be doing Gabby's show. Oh, on the birthday. <laughs> uh, yay! Oh, oh, oh. But so, it's all good. It's going to be a great show. Yeah. It's going to be awesome. That's right. As the Kai one says, July 29, 2020, you can go to our website, atgtheater.com, to buy your ticket for 36 bucks. It's yeah. going to be a great evening, and it's also live. Yes, so yeah. it's yeah. going to be neat. Yes, that's amazing. Uh, before we say goodbye, we have a, a questionnaire to ask you, but I just wanted to also say, I know people say when they work with you, Mark, um, and Louise, this is the same thing, that you, you, you musically cover them and hug them so that they feel so confident and comfortable. When, when this is I've heard singers say this. And you're both such uh, kind, uh, authentic, wonderful people with tremendous talent. So, as Avery said, we're both so um, grateful for our relationship professionally, but personally as well. Thank you. Oh, yeah, well, thanks. we feel the same yeah. way being no. part of the family. It's, it's awesome. It's family. Yeah. It really is Thank family. Yeah. Well, yeah. Before we go, always we have the Harold Green look. Oh. Oh, there you go. There's a new look. <laughs> That's for him, right? That's, That's for him, yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh man. Wow. That was, that was date no. night. Wasn't that date night for you guys? <laughs> <laughs> And then I'm going to dress up as. Yeah, exactly. Oh, my God. That's a great picture. So we, we, we finish each interview with the Harold Green lightning round. Okay? okay. You have to answer one, one word or two word answers. Okay? First okay. question. Louise, you go first, and then Mark. Okay. okay. What do you put on your latkes? Applesauce or sour cream? Sour cream. Sour cream. On your bagel and cream cheese, lux or nothing? Lux. Lux. Favorite Jewish comedian? Oh, uh, Sammy Khan. Ooh. Ooh, very good. Oh, man. You got to be I'm a the... Jew to know that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't... Oh, God, I'm the worst with names. Pass. Pass. <laughs> a favorite actor. Favorite actor. Jewish actor or straight? No, well, regular actor. Any actor. Who do you oh, love? Um, ooh, One actor. Um, Jude Law. Um, um, who's the guy from... Uh, I'm the worst with names. Who's the guy from... Uh... One of your boyfriends? Yes. Uh, 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 how many? There's so many you have. Samuel Jackson. Yes, that's right. Samuel Jackson. Favorite film? 
Oh, I have many. Sound of music. Sound of music. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, all the Star Wars. Star Wars. I wanted to talk about Lego everything. Uh, your, um, pineapple, pineapple on pizza, yes or no? No. Uh, do, do, do any of you have a tattoo? No. No. Oh. If you oh. had one word for the future of humanity, what would that word be? Love. Yes, I was going to say kindness. Love. Yes. Mm, yeah, love and kindness. Yeah. Well, guys, once again, Matt, if you want to come say hi again, thanks to Matt, our GM and backstage guy. There you go. Woo! And, uh, thank you. This is our family. Mark, yeah. um, thank you so much for a great for a great hour. It was uh, it was fantastic, and we we love you. And uh, and uh, thanks again. Yay! Can't wait to work with you guys. Us. Thank you so much. Awesome. Yeah. Good. This is awesome. Great. Take care. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.